you guys want to pray with me, we'll get started with the worship. Lord, we, we thank you, uh, Lord, that we can come here today to this uh, school, Lord. And, uh, Lord, I have so many great memories here. And, uh, Lord, I just thank you for what you did in my life here at CBI and what we're doing in these students' lives. Father, I pray as we worship you, that you would just become the center of our attention, the center of our praise, and the center of our adoration this morning. Lord, we know that you're already here, you're already ready to work in our lives. So we lift this time up to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh 
too great for you, Lord. I just thank you, God, for the amazing grace that you show us, Lord. Lord, to you be the honor, the glory, and the praise.
to guide us, to direct us, to convict us, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you'd speak through Pastor Gary, that you'd have your way in this place this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, the better way, 
Uh, I, have you guys studied through Acts? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so you know Paul on his uh, second missionary journey here in Acts 18. Um, he's just done battle with the philosophical giants at Mars Hill. The Stoic and the Epicurean philosophers were gathered against Paul, and all the snobbery of the elite of the day, they looked down upon this tent maker who was there before him, uh, before them trying to preach. And uh, you remember, Paul's sermon was superb. I mean, he was culturally irrelevant. He had incredible wi wisdom. He even used their own poets, secular poets, to try to reach them. But the response there in Athens uh, to this spectacular presentation was very minimal. And the learned people of the day, they mocked him. Some wanted to hear more later, but they didn't get the chance. Paul hightailed out of Athens quickly. And a handful of people believed um, there was never a church established in Athens. And it's going to seem as Paul leaves Athens, I believe he's feeling defeated. And we can picture him kicking rocks now on the way to Corinth. He had a lot to think about. He's been through a lot in his journey here in Macedonia and, and, and now in the lower parts of Greece. <clears throat> Maybe he's thinking, why didn't I mention Jesus' name there on Mars Hill? Why didn't I mention the cross? He left all of that out in his gospel presentation up there. And there's a lot of debate as to what happened in Athens. Many see it as Paul's greatest moment in ministry, the greatest homily that he's ever spoken. And um, However, many see it as a very low point. And I remember being at a, a pastor's round table, um, and the discussion got brought up on why the young people are leaving the church in droves. And many of those pastors, they went to this text uh, of Paul there in Athens on the Areopagus, and um, <clears throat> they presented this idea that we need to equip the young people with more apologetics. They need to know how to combat the culture that they are in. Instead of uh, doing what we do and teaching the, them Bible studies, let's teach them how to combat and argue with the culture. And typically I like to stay quiet in such settings. I don't like to talk because I usually see things a little different and through a, a more unpopular Lens, And, you know, I'm a basic Bible teacher, as I said, and I try to see things simply through the scriptures. And I watched this discussion pop around with excitement as they laid out their battle plans and what they were going to do. And on the wall behind one of uh, the guys who was kind of leading this discussion, and, you know, this uh, pastor was from a big church. He had a lot of clout. And I saw behind him... These verses from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. And if you're able, I know I told you to turn to uh, Acts 18, but turn to 1 Corinthians 13. And we'll just read that so we can kind of get our context of what's going on here in Corinth. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, it starts off, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. In verse 4 he says, Love suffers long. It is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, it is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will fail, whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. He says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. 
For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. Uh, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And out of nowhere, you know, we're in this pastor's meeting. I'll bring you back to that setting. I see this on the wall. And one of the pastors across the table, he shouts out, Gary, what do you think about all this? And I really, I just hang my head down. I didn't want to speak up. I didn't want to get involved. And I looked at those verses, though, and things clicked for me. I told him, you know, Paul had a great sermon that day on Mars Hill. It was phenomenal. The apologetics were great. He was culturally relevant. But Paul surely did have a crisis between Athens and Corinth. He changed his ministry model. He found a better way. Better than arguing with people with clanging words and, and noise. In fact, it seems uh, that was the more immature approach, the childish-like approach. And Paul put those things away when he came to Corinth. And his approach was through simpler means. And more reliance on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul actually tells us how he came into the city of Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, I'll read it to you. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. See, Paul, he did not come into Corinth with these persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. This is a huge contrast than what happened there at Mars Hill. Again, Athens was never repeated in Paul's ministry. So I told the guys at that pastor's round table, a better way is not through more debate and argument, but equipping the youth for a true ministry. Paul demonstrated Christianity through long-suffering and patient agape love there in Corinth. I said, I really don't think that the problem with the youth today is their atheist professors. I don't think that's why they're leaving the church in droves. I think the church is no longer demonstrating the power of God. I said, sure, you know, their parents will drag them to church. I was dragged to church my whole childhood. I seen the adults in the church raising their hands, worshiping on Sunday, and I knew what they were like in their homes. You know, and a lot of the kids today, they see their parents living these two lives, you know, they have one of worshiping in church and they go home and they're indulging in pornography, getting drunk, you know, fighting with one another, uh, chasing that financial care that the world has put in front of their nose. And I said, I think the problem is not the world at all. And you can teach these kids to argue a very good point, a valid point, a right point, but are we teaching them the better way to love? to a, uh, this sacrificial degree that Paul did here in Corinth. And I ended by saying it seems we might be settling for raising up an army of Pharisees who can argue every religious point to the T, who can make the church culturally relevant, but in their heart of hearts, the power of God is absent in their demonstration. And after I said that, you know, the gentleman from the big church, he didn't appreciate the words that I said or the accusations toward the church, and he shut me down. And he went back to his diatribe and went back to being silent where I belonged. And uh, shortly thereafter, I found out that that gentleman, he fell out of the ministry, did whatever, and he was no longer in that big, exciting, culturally dynamic ministry, raising up an army of Pharisees. Uh, it all faded out as quickly as Paul's ministry on Mars Hill. So Paul, at this point in his ministry, understand he has been beaten severely, Okay. He's been imprisoned, he's been persecuted at every stop, and now he was intellectually humiliated on Mars Hill. And it's easy to understand why he came into Corinth in weakness and fear and in much trembling. I want you to understand something, and this is a problem that we have sometimes. We make these Bible heroes superheroes. These are just mere men. 
Paul's a man, and this trauma seems to be taking a toll on this great apostle. I even picture him here experiencing PTSD, ministerial fatigue. He's at the end of his rope. Take the image of Superman out of your head. The Apostle Paul, he was a mighty man. He had a great determination, but he was a man. And understand the fragile frame of mind that he is at this point as he comes into Corinth. Now look with me at verse 1 of chapter 18. It says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and he went to Corinth. I just want to, for context sake, talk about Corinth. It was a major Greek city at the time that Rome's empire ruled around the Mediterranean. Uh, it was an important crossroad for trade and travel. It was a, a city that was notorious for its sexual immorality. And, and this is interesting. Paul wrote the book of Romans from the city of Corinth. And think about that. He's looking right out his window and he's writing things like this in Romans 1.26. For this reason, God gave them up to their vile passions, for even women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also men, leaving the natural use of the women, burn in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And he's looking out, and he's seeing a culture that is debased, fallen, sexual, immoral. Corinth was known for its sexual perversions and had a reputation for drunkenness and crowding so much so that even in classical Greek stage performances when uh, a Corinthian was in the performance he was pictured as uh, a companion of prostitutes so now the discouraged the beaten the weary apostle Paul is now confronted with the spiritual depravity that is buffeting up directly against that moral spirit that he had, and understand please, the spiritual toll of this kind of perversion uh, that it would have on a, a person's soul would be great. It would be very difficult. Look now, starting in verse 2. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, and who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation they were tent makers, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. I want to stop there for a moment. And as we understand here, we get a glimpse uh, or a summary here of the ministry in Corinth. The first people Paul meets uh, are this famous couple, Aquila and Pris Priscilla. I love them. You know, for a long time people referred to my wife and I as Gary and Jess, and I, I likened uh, unto uh, Aquila and Priscilla. I'd like to be known in the ministry with my wife. A uh, famous couple. Uh, they were Jews. And we see they were forced to leave Rome. This would be during the rule of Claudius. Uh, around the year 49 AD, anti-Semitism arose there in Rome. And Claudius expelled all the Jews. They made their way to Corinth. They were tent makers as well. Uh, and Paul met them through his trade. This is something that I really appreciate about the Jews. Whereas the Greeks... They thought that labor or working with your hands was appalling, that it was meant for the lower class. The Jews actually taught that work was a very important and honorable part of life. They taught every Jewish boy a trade. And if the parents failed to teach them a trade, they had a saying, if you don't teach your son a trade, you're raising him to be a thief. And this is something that has been greatly lost today. Once again, uh, this is something that I uh, talk about that is probably counter the church culture today. But I advocate, especially for Bible college students and seminary students, to learn a trade. That you have something to fall back onto. You know, the Bible colleges today, the seminaries, they have more incorporated the Greeks' view of work. And the reason the rabbis, and this was important, the rabbis in Paul's day, uh, they also had a trait to fall back on. Uh, they, uh, you know, they needed to work so they would never lose touch with the common people, the ordinary people. Especially when they taught, they didn't want to teach above the ordinary people. It protected them from getting too high and lofty in their knowledge to where it lost all application for the average person. I'm a huge advocate for tent making. 
you know, the ministry is super unpredictable, you know, and I would encourage you, if you have it in your heart and mind that you're going to go right out of Bible college, right into full-time ministry, um, that, I would say, could be a very perilous and bad idea. I remember telling Elijah this before he came here, you know, and, and maybe you can ask him afterwards how he felt about that. Um, but it's a hard thing to hear, you know. We have these hopes, these dreams. But I would uh, put it at least two years of learning work, hard work, you know, something to fall back on. Uh, I know we started in Victorville, 15 people in the church, you know, they, you know, they, they, it's not something they can uh, do to support a pastor full time. And things change, you know, coronavirus hit, we all thought we were going to go back to work, you know, and these are things that, that are very important to think about. I'm a huge advocate of tent making. And I believe even what I teach the pastors at my church that are on staff, I need to teach them to have a good work habit, to stay efficient and outside crack. So when a pastor comes on staff at Calvary Chapel, Victorville, not only do they get a book allowance for their studies, uh, but I get them a janitor key, I get them a sufficient tool set, and I get them a big old 32 ounce hammer. Because I refuse to have a man on staff that is swinging, uh, you know, a little girl hammer that my wife <laughs> swings. I want them to swing a man hammer. <laughs> you know, we've lost masculinity in the ministry today. Uh, we have more fragile philosophers than anything. So you see, this prepares our pastor's mentality for what lay ahead for them in the ministry, and this is important. I remember when Pastor Josh, his first week on staff, I asked him to do a project that required using a, a power drill. And I was watching him, and uh, he couldn't operate the thing. And, and for me, you know, I, I admit, and I told him I was really judgmental. And I went home to my wife, and I said, babe, you can't even use power tools. And she said, well, babe, you can't play guitar. And she says, Pastor Josh is up there playing guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she put me quickly in my place, you know, and he can make spoons sound wonderful on a worship team, you know. <laughs> But over the last five years, uh, Pastor Josh, he's not only mastered the use of a cordless drill and other tools, he's developed an incredible work ethic, you know, and uh, he's now leaps and bounds from where he began that first day, and he's uh, learned many trades now, and he's, you know, climbed through the attic, wiring up our camera systems, he's doing the electrical work around the place, and uh, the other day he was wiring some new lights outside on our church, and I was humbled to see that, because now he's surpassed anything that I've ever taught him in regards to the trades. He's doing things that I can't do now uh, as far as the trades are concerned. And I still can't play the guitar. <laughs> so, it's pretty impressive. We, not, we brought another pastor on staff this year and uh, gave him his tool set. And his first mission was to replace all the toilets on the church campus. You know, he came, came in, he had high and lofty hopes, so I get all this time to study and, you know, uh, philosophize and, and now he understands the reality that ministry is hard work. But you should keep your tent making ministries proficient. You never know what's going to happen. You need to know how to work. You don't want to become out of touch philosophers. I keep a wood business on the side. You know, I cut off fingers every now and then. Uh, I think every true man should at least have one finger <laughs> cut off. <laughs> <laughs> but it's important to stay proficient, you know, in these things, you know. So I keep a side business just to keep me uh, in touch. And, you know, what it does, it does a lot of things. I don't know if you've been told you know what kind of servant you are when you're treated like a servant. And there are loads of wood that I take out and people treat me like a servant. And it's good for me. I need to be treated that way. I need to be brought down to reality. I remember I texted um, Elijah a few weeks ago and I said, hey, you want to join me in some bone crushing labor? And he did join me, brought his brother, but he said, Pastor, if you want to get my generation to work, you wouldn't use that headline to get them to come to work. <laughs> but uh, he had a good day of work that day on the wood pile. And see, it keeps you in touch with the people. You get shoulder to shoulder with people. And 
I get to share Jesus with my neighbors and people in the communities. I deliver the, the loads and get to invite people to church. I get to pray with uh, strangers. And it's a humbling thing. I found that too many church leaders, you know, they're treated as the big cheese in their churches. And the sad thing is that I noticed they believe that they are the big cheese. And they're out of touch with the common person. And they know very little of servanthood. The people kind of surround them and serve them. I had a pastor one time visiting at our church, helping out with a memorial. And, uh, he, you know, he's from a big church again, and uh, he's the big cheese. And he said that he would help clean up after the memorial. And I watched him, and he put it, we have a backpack vacuum, and he was going, and uh, I seen him start in the sanctuary. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. He's, you know, humble enough to vacuum. Two hours later, I go out there, and the vacuum's in the middle of the sanctuary. He didn't vacuum the sanctuary. It was all undone, and... Uh, I went on to Facebook a little after that, and I seen that there's a picture of him with that backpack vacuum on, and the picture headline says, My Pastor the Servant. So he put that thing on just for a picture and put it on Instagram. Look at my pastor, you know, and, and uh, he just wanted to get a picture of himself. It was a false advertisement, but he's the big cheese somewhere, you know, and... Uh, so the petty workers at our church, they handled it, you know. But I would tell you this, too. And we were talking about this on the way here. If you're one of those social media Christians where you can't pray for someone without posting it on uh, your trumpet blast ministry post, you know, on your social media, uh, I would tell you, you probably shouldn't have a, a social media platform. If it's just a place where you're just kind of promoting yourself and your style and and all the good things that you're doing, you're doing it for the wrong thing, you know, and uh, I see this a lot, it's a celebrity pastoritis that's kind of taking over the ministry, you know, and uh, people want to show everybody how awesome they are, uh, you understand that's narcissism, right, Amen. when you want people just praising you, you want the comments, you want the likes, you want the attention, that's narcissism, you are now becoming uh, the center of attention instead of the God you're serving, uh, I hope that doesn't offend any of you. I don't know any of you, you know, so I, I didn't come here to you know, pick, pick on any of you. But, you know, keep going. <laughs> what's that? I said it's good, keep going. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to take a picture as a group, and I'm going to see No, no. We don't do, the, do it for people's accolades. And the thing is, with people, they will praise you one moment, they'll tell you you're doing a great job one moment, and they'll turn on you at the next, you know, and, and that's the reality of ministry. And so many uh, ministers today, they're just slothful and lazy in the work, unless it's posted somewhere. They won't even serve the Lord unless they're getting some kind of attention for it. So working, hard work, is a godly attribute. Especially when you do it unto the Lord. It's not a, a low thing. It's a, a necessary thing. Paul made his connections here in Corinth while working his trade. And there's nothing more effective in building strong relationships with someone than getting shoulder to shoulder with them. And working hard to complete a, a project or a task together. It's important that a minister of God uh, not only has a good study habit, but a fervent work ethic. And there are many times in the ministry where these things become very important. And I think a, an honest look at the scriptures would show that uh, God has a special interest in those who work. You know, I mean, from Gideon, threshing the wheat, uh, all through the Old Testament, uh, his disciples, they were tradesmen. He, he likes those that work. My father, um, for decades, he served as a chaplain for the San Bernardino County Sheriff Department. This was his tent making. Um, we have one assistant pastor uh, who was a substitute teacher, and he does that every now and then. He gets him in with the community, the kids. Uh, but my father's ministry is pretty cool because you arrest someone, um, and you have a captive audience the whole way to jail. You know, they got to listen to to him preach. It was a pretty cool thing, a neat ministry, and he got to minister shoulder to shoulder with the cops. 
So Paul here makes his connection, and, and things are looking up now as God sends Paul some friends, and the Lord will do this for you in the ministry, and it's usually just at the right time. He will connect your heart deeply, spiritually, with someone. And these friends here, Aquila and Priscilla, will be dear to the Apostle Paul for many years to come. And we can imagine uh, this is actually probably starting to bring life back to the Apostle's soul once again. And next we're going to see at last uh, Silas and Timothy. They're going to find Paul. He sent for them when he was in Athens. They catch up to him in Corinth. And if you study through uh, First and Second Thessalonians, you're going to see that when they arrived to the Apostle Paul, they brought incredible news. Because Paul thought the churches up in northern Macedonia were failing because of the persecution. He didn't know what was happening to the... And, and they came and said, Paul, they're not failing at all. In fact, they're thriving. They're, they're enduring through persecution. And now they're even being a light to the, the surrounding churches. So these things, you can imagine, the good news is, is stirring them up. And these two faithful friends in the ministry, they bring not only good news, but they also brought support from northern uh, Greece and Macedonia. And remember, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church how uh, he worked with his own hands among them. He didn't uh, ask anything of them, and it was the church in the north that uh, actually supported his ministry there. 2 Corinthians 11, 9, he says, When I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied, and in everything I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. So the arrival of Paul... And I'm sorry, Silas and Timothy would be another blessed moment for Paul. Look at verse 5. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. So these two fellow workers, they brought a measure of strength to the Apostle Paul's ministry. He, he was blessed by the gift from the north. And he now uh, has the support of these uh, two workers, these fellow workers. And he's able now to devote... Um, more time to the ministry. The Holy Spirit compels him to go to the Jews and to preach Jesus Christ as their Messiah, their long-awaited Messiah. Now, remember, Paul had an incredible burden for his fellow Jews. And we see here he would not uh, linger, however, long with them after their rejection. He still keeps his ministry to the Jew first, but he's not willing to get bogged down in the ministry any longer with them. And he's going to begin to move on quicker from these types of settings. Verse 6, and when they opposed him and blasphemed him, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. And then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So because Paul did not get bogged down with the Jews, he was able to enter into this powerful work among the Gentiles, and it was right next to the Jewish synagogue. We see here Crispus, who was the ruler of the synagogue. He actually comes to faith. He's born again, and we're going to see later on that he is replaced by a vengeful and spiteful man. Now Paul, he knew the routine, and if you study through Acts, you know the routine. As soon as he stirred up the beehive at the synagogue, he knew that hostility was coming his way very quickly. And here in Corinth, uh, even with all the encouragement that's been coming to Paul, this high moment in ministry that has taken place among the Gentiles, understand he is still dealing with PTSD and immense pressure. And, and uh, I believe he might even be depressed and afraid at this point. Many I disagree with that assessment. Uh, because in their minds, Paul is this superhero. He's more than a man. But understand, God would not have to comfort the Apostle Paul in the manner that he does next unless Paul was suffering from destabilizing fears. Look at verse 9. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in a night vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you. And he promises no one will attack you. To hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And this is the case in ministry when you are being used in this fallen world to bring others into the kingdom of God, out of the kingdom of darkness. There is immense joy in the ministry, but also immense hardship. And it happens all at once. 
The fruit of the ministry is, is a cause for celebration. When people are coming to salvation, when the church is growing, you rejoice and heaven rejoices with you in the ministry. But like Paul here, it comes at a great cost. Understand this. The enemy hates everything that we do in the ministry. And he will be quick to strive. And God being merciful, he gives the Apostle Paul an incredible promise here. And if, uh, again, you study through Acts, you know that he never stayed at any place too long. But here in Corinth, we see him for the first time, he stays there. This promise that God has given him for protection is a wonderful promise for the Apostle Paul. He, he wants to stay where God has promised that he will protect him. He did, this promise is for Corinth only. It's not for, uh, for the rest of his journeys. <clears throat> Paul, I, I imagine at this point he couldn't take another beating. He couldn't take another imprisonment. He hadn't rested for hundreds of miles at this point. From city to city, he's been rushed out. He's not even had time to recover from his severe beatings. His wounds, you can imagine, are still open, raw, painful. And God knew this incredible man had limits and here in Corinth. And, and really, this is the only place we see Paul get this reprieve. But here, God gives him a sure word. Uh, you see, although the encouragement from meeting those true friends in Aquila and Priscilla, being rejoined in the ministry by the companion Silas and Timothy, receiving the blessing, the offering from the, from the north, the Apostle Paul's <clears throat> fears of what may come seemingly superseded it all. And God granted him a vision, a good word, a promise. And understand, although God gave this promise, it doesn't mean that the roaring lion, Satan, is not going to circle and try to strike more fear into the Apostle Paul's ministry. Look what happens next. It says, when Galileo, the proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord, I'm sorry, when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against the Apostle Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. So the Jews here, they bring a familiar accusation to Galileo, uh, the proconsul or the governor of this region. Same accusation they brought in other places. Now this trial is very important here. This ruling, this court hearing, would have a great impact on the Apostle Paul's ministry. If Galileo ruled against Paul, it would have impacted him throughout the whole region of Achaia, and not just in this one city or province. If the Jews had any chance, it was in this courtroom to bring the Apostle Paul's ministry down. And we can picture Paul, you know, uh, next to the Roman proconsul, there was what was called the lictors. Now these guys were like the bailiffs today, but they had rods in hand, and uh, you know that Paul's been beaten with rods at this point uh, many times, and he's looking at those Roman lictors. And he's wondering if he's going to get another beating here at this hearing. Paul, perhaps fearing the worst, but remember, he had that promise from God concerning the happenings in Corinth. And we see this promise was true. It was sure Paul will not even have to bring his own defense before the pro council. God had already moved on this powerful man's heart. Look what happens in verse 14. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, uh, there would be reason why I should bear with you. Uh, but if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves. For I do not want to be judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo uh, took no notice of these things. Now, Galileo uh, had an interesting reputation. According to his brother Seneca, uh, he was the kindest man who ever lived. He was a fair judge. And here he does not see that the government has any legitimate role deciding these religious matters. And he's correct in his thinking. And we see, uh, too, where here when street justice took place right in front of him, he just looked the other way. Remember, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, he became a Christian. He's with the church now. So his replacement here, Sosthenes, is now uh, prominent in this scene. And this has always fascinated, great, uh, fascinated me greatly. Uh, you remember Paul, he told the Corinthians that his ministry in Corinth was not validated by human words of wisdom or by pontificating or oration. 
But in 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 5, he said it was in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So what happened to this man, Sosthenes, who is humiliated and beaten here? He was leading the charge against the church. His intentions were evil. His actions were diabolical against the Apostle Paul. And here the wrath that he was trying to inflict upon the Apostle Paul came upon him. And he got the beating. Now what did the Apostle Paul do that uh, was so powerful in demonstration in Corinth? In his weakness and in his trembling. What happened here? I think it was uh, something greater and better than the defense that he gave up at Mars Hill. Remember, Paul demonstrated that great love that Jesus taught about. Paul would actually write about this great love from the city of Corinth. And, and this is really cool. He wrote to the church in Rome from Corinth, and he wrote these words in Romans 12, 17 through 21, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heat coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is kind of like our closing point here. Uh, Paul could have looked at Sosthenes, beaten there on the ground, and, and humiliated and shamed. And Paul could have gloated over that pitiful man. He could have kicked him while he was down. He could have led others in jeering him and mocking him further. He could have taught from this scene that this man reaped what he had sown. Sosthenes deserved this for coming after the church in such a way. This is justice for interfering with the gospel. But Paul demonstrated something here, and there's a good reason to believe, uh, I believe, that Paul did not repay this man evil for evil, that he actually had regard for good toward him. As much as was possible up to the apostle Paul, he was committed to living peaceably with all men. I mean, really, how could Paul avenge himself, you know, and, and perhaps as he even watched this beating, he could feel every blow. He knows what a beating feels like. He knew the pain of it all. And he knows that Jesus taught, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. And Paul ultimately knew to overcome this kind of evil was to do so with good intentions. Now, we don't know the whole story of what happened here in Corinth. Uh, but the dots do connect for us when we read the very first verse of the letter to the Corinthian church. Paul addresses the church there with a, a, a greeting from himself and a very interesting brother in 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. He says, Paul called a, an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. I believe, in, I, I believe it was Chuck Smith who first pointed this out and connected the dots in his teaching, but it seems as though Paul fought this evil with the kindness and the goodness that our God asks us to show others. And the results were incredibly fruitful. You understand when you fight evil with evil, evil wins out the day. When you love, even when someone does not respect you or honor you, uh, eventually good will win out the day. When you have the ability, you know, in, in, when you leave this place and you get jobs or whatever you do, and maybe you'll have the ability to cheat your boss and get away with it, you know, just to cheat your hours a little here, a little there, or, you know, steal a pen here or there, you know, and you have these things, uh, these opportunities before you, but you remain upright and honest, uh, good will win out the day, even if your boss is a dirtbag. I remember early on in my marriage, shortly after we gave our life to the Lord, my wife, um, she went to Home Depot and she got me one of my beloved, uh, most beloved, cherished gifts that she'd ever got me, and it was a huge box. And uh, I like DeWalt tools, if you know tools. And it was a DeWalt job site radio. Mm -hmm. And she was so happy, her eyes were beaming. And she knew that it was my love language, you know, <laughs> something for the job site. And, uh, but she made me promise her. She said, listen to nothing but Christian radio on this thing. And uh, I promised her, you know, that day I, I promised. And, and I was running crews at that time. And... Uh, 
my crews hated it, but I listened to Christian music, I listened to Christian teaching all day, and uh, my boss in particular, the superintendent of the company, he would go from job to job, he would come on our job, and he hated the fact that I listened to this uh, Christian music, that I subjected my crew to it, and the uh, first thing he'd do is turn that thing off, and he'd get angry with me, and uh, you know, you shouldn't be forcing this down their throat kind of thing, and uh, uh, but he had a healthy respect for my wife, and I'd say, hey, Marty, I promised my wife, man. And uh, he would, one day he came back and he, he said, you know, your wife will never know if here on the job site you turn the station. I know you promised her, but she'll never know. And I said, well, Marty, you know, every day I track the hours of this crew here, and on Friday I turn in their hours to you. You would never know if I gave them a few more hours on their time card, you know? You trust me to be honest and have integrity in my word to you. And he looked at me, he puffed, and he walked off, and he never asked me to change the radio station again. But you see, a good way, the right way, the Jesus way, uh, is to overcome evil with good. And whatever Paul demonstrated in Corinth, we see Sosthenes is now saved, he is a brother, he's brought into the church, and. This is why Paul could write uh, those words to the Corinthian church about the depths of this better way. You know, think of, of these words now in the context of, of what is happening. In 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, he says, Love suffers long. It is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. And you see, true ministry is long-suffering. Mm. It's getting shoulder to shoulder with people and doing life with them. It's enduring through life, the ups and downs of life. Goodness, we've been through so much together. Over a decade, we've been serving the Lord together. Uh, and this is true ministry. You know, I, I know sometimes we get it in our heads that the world is waiting for us to just start preaching. Once I get my pulpit, the people are going to flock. The church is going to be huge. And that, that's not the true reality. I'd encourage you to get like a 10-year a plan in your mind, a 10-year vision, even longer. Maybe you're thinking about getting another job and, and, and not going straight into the ministry. And let the Lord kind of direct you slowly, you know. And, and you don't want to go in into the ministry of a philosopher from Athens. You want to go into to the ministry with life experience, relatable experience to the people that you're going to be ministering to, that you're going to be shoulder to shoulder with, doing life with. <laughs> Super important. I think we'll stop there. Does 
incredible things that I can't do, you know. I mean, trades are all kinds of things, you know. For me, it's labor. I'm a knuckle dragger, you know. But for you guys, it's it could be something else, you know. And just have something that can you can fall back on that can be there to help your family out when you're in need, you know. You don't you don't want to be in a bad place, especially when you have kids and a wife, and you, you, you just want to have something to fall back on to. Um, I feel like I can wire pretty good. I think I'll just struggle with like EMT technique and bending it. Oh, yeah, that's. How did you? Because I feel like now once you bend it, like it's it's over. Like if you, if you mess up. So you're talking about the conduit, right? Yeah. So conduit is uh, you just gotta be doing it, man. Yeah. There's uh, tell them who taught you how to learn, man. Yeah. So so funny enough, um, good friend of mine. He he just passed away last year. He's uh. He's an older guy in the church, and he was a professional electrician for a long time. Um, and, and what he wanted to serve the Lord with was, is he wanted to, to do any kind of electrical jobs uh, around the facility, right? Mm -hmm. and, and at the time, I, I had already, I was already on staff, right? Yeah. But, and uh, he had, he reached out to me, and he kind of said, hey, I'm, I'm going to disciple you on this stuff. You're just gonna come along with me, and we're we're gonna do it together, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and truly, what I would encourage you to do is is in your church or, or somewhere find somebody who serves the church in that aspect, and and ask if they'll disciple you. That's 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 what I would do. That's that's what he did with me. Yeah. Um, and I'm by no means an expert electrician, you know. But I know Tom. He he taught me everything. Everything that I you know know now. Yeah, you're knowing the people. Dude, my church. my favorite work day I've ever had in my entire life, and probably maybe ever, who knows? Um, we we were doing um, a, a replacement on all of our parking lot lights, right? And we're talking 40, 50 feet up in the air. Um, so we rented a boom net, and so it was Tom and I for two days straight in that boom net, <laughs> just just shoulder to shoulder the entire day. No, no coming down for lunch. It was just up there for. Eight nine hours a day. Wow. That was the best couple days I've ever had. And we talked all the time. You know, life, you know, you know yeah. the people that you're ministering to and ministering with. You know, it's, it's real valuable time. You don't ever want to view them as oh they're coming in here as servants. You know, you you get down there in the trenches with them and be a servant with them. Mm -hmm. we, we wear work boots mm -hmm. at our church. You know, yeah, we're not afraid to lay. Um, so, when you were preparing for ministry, when did you know you had the calling and what kind of confirmed it as you stepped forward? Yeah, I was actually, I knew that I was called into the ministry at a very young age, <clears throat> and I did the Jonah thing, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't want anything to do with it, you know, and so I knew that, that there was a calling, ran from it, and uh, we, we gave our lives to the Lord in Lake Havasu City, and the pastor you know, we were just off methamphetamine. We were literally monsters, man. And uh, we, at that point, just lived in the church. Every time the doors were open, we were off work. We were there serving, and he put us in with the three to five year olds. Mm -hmm. And I, like I said, I never had ambition. I would have been content teaching the three to five year olds all the days of my life. But when you guys start in a ministry and you're just faithful, God tends to kind of just move you along. You know, He moves you. I never asked for. Uh, a position anywhere, and we went from there to the ushers ministry, uh, then into youth ministry, and then youth ministry led to uh, senior pastor. But it was n nothing ever that I, I wanted. I can't express that enough. If you have ambition, I've seen that to be very unhealthy in the ministry. If it's like, I just have to be in front of people. You see pastors preaching, I, I can't wait to be that guy. For me, it's painful. There's weeks where I'm sitting in that front row, he's getting done with worship, and I'm just sitting there waiting for the senior pastor to go up, and I'm like, I'm that guy, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it's a humbling thing. I'm an introvert, an extreme introvert. I'm comfortable in dark corners. I don't like being in front of people. Uh, I'm an awkward person, and it's a stretch for me. You know, I can relate to Moses when he's like, just use Aaron, he's a better speaker. You know, get him out in front of the people. I don't like it, it's super painful. Um, 
but I love God's word. And I, I love to dissect it. I love doing what we just did right now, kind of looking at the scriptures, maybe taking a different viewpoint than uh, a lot of the other guys, you know, a more simplistic viewpoint. Uh, I never had the Bible college training or anything like that. My, my Bible college was on the job site listening to Chuck Smith and other Bible teachers, and then they just washed my mind, and that was it. And uh, I have a huge library, you know, and fantastic. You know, I'm a big library in my office, and I just like to read. I have no accreditation from man. In fact, I've always been told that I will never be a pastor. I mean, from uh, early on, I remember there was a lady in the church who was a doctor's wife. And she took it upon herself to email me, and she said, I just want you to know that you will never be a pastor. <laughs> she said, you don't have the education. Um, you don't have the charisma, you're not an amp, you know, all, the, all the stuff, and she, everything she said was true, you know, and it is maybe right, and she went on and got divorced, her life fell apart, but, you know, I'm a pastor, it, and, but we've had that kind of thing through the whole journey, you'll never be, you'll never do this, you'll never, and then the Lord just kind of dragged us along. Thank you. So, what is... This is a longer question, but what is the hardest lesson you've had to learn as a pastor? And from that lesson, what advice would you give someone who feels called to be a pastor? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you have a similar story, question, what is the hardest lesson you've learned as a pastor? Right. And from that lesson, what advice would you give someone called to be a pastor? Okay, this happened to both of us, and I think it was probably the greatest growing lesson. It happened to me in Lake Havasu. I was the junior high pastor in... Uh, the senior pastor came and, and talked to me about coming on staff full time. And again, I never had it in my head to do that. And it was an exciting thing because I was framing houses in hell. It's literally hot <laughs> as hell. Yeah. Was that was that that was that was 120 sometimes? 120 sometimes. And, yeah. and I was thinking, yeah, you know, my game. first thought was like, I get to get out of the heat framing these mm -hmm. houses and I'll, you know, <laughs> be a youth pastor. It's a great thing. And it was literally, so he asked me if I would be willing to do this. Yeah, I'll come on staff, you know. And then uh, the next day he called me and he says, hey, we got a, um, another guy coming. He's from the Bible college, he's a little more qualified than you are. And I remember I was really bitter, you know. I was like, man, you know, the, you asked me to come on and all this. And I called my father up and told him what happened, told him I was angry. And I remember he asked a really profound question. He said, are you serving uh, for position, or are you serving Jesus? Mm. And because uh, I, I wanted to leave the church, I wanted to, you know, quit altogether. These people who are, you know, and, and we just stayed faithful. I stayed loyal to the pastor. I loved the guy. And um, shortly after that, it wasn't that church that I came on full time. I came on full time out here in Apple Valley with my father, you know, and uh, didn't even see that coming. But it was. It was a test of my ego, and uh, I failed miserably at first, you know, and then as the Lord began to pick us up, and we just stayed faithful in the ministry, the dots came together. Same thing happened to him, you can tell them. Yeah, then real briefly, I was <coughs> leading worship for the, the guy who was leading worship at Calvary Apple Valley, and he had hurt himself, so I was filling in for, for months, and boy, I must have been a 20. But I remember, um, you know, it had been so long, and, and he was stepping down, right? And, and so in our church, there was really no one else to step up. And, um, you know, so it was kind of something that I had just assumed, right? Like, oh, it's like, oh, I'll be the next worship leader, you know? And I remember his dad called me into his office and said, hey, we're, we're going to bring on uh, Jacob, who's one of my best friends, and he actually had just come back to the church. He was uh, actually got a bubble yeah. <laughs> um, And uh, you know, they were like, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna bring him on staff, and he's going to be the next worship leader." And, and I remember it, it devastated me, right? Like I, much like Pastor Barry, I was I was super bitter. Like that was, you know, it was it was a huge learning experience, and, and I'm pretty sure your dad or someone, it was you. You told me just serve Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Hardest time in ministry, but it, this is the most important time because then it tests your motives. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and at the time too, I was waiting tables, right? It's not mm -hmm. not framing in hell, but yeah. I, was, I was waiting tables at, at 
the local Alderman, right? And uh, I remember I wanted to get out of that so bad because, you know, has anyone ever waited tables before? All right, yeah, so you guys know. You get, you get treated real bad sometimes. Yeah. Right? Like, like a servant, right? Like you are a servant. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, I remember I wanted to get out of that so bad. You know, I wanted to, to be brought on staff. And, um, man, the Lord just opened my eyes that, that I was there for a reason. And, and before you know it, as I started to serve Jesus at the church, I started to serve Jesus at my work. And, and you, you guys know, I'm two servers, like, you know, it gets, it gets pretty stressful. And people flip out, and, and they, they need a whole lot of Jesus, you know. Yeah. And so it, it turned into a mission uh, field for sure, but, but then stepping out of that, when, when the Lord did call me into ministry, the Lord revealed that, that he had me go through that so I could learn to be a servant. Mm -hmm. you know, I was treated like a day in and day out. People asked for something, they'd make me sing happy birthday. That was my least favorite thing. <laughs> right? like, I hated singing happy birthday. Um, yeah, happy birthday. Yeah, every time, every day. And, uh, but you know what? It was, it was being a servant. You know, it's not about you, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's what the Lord brought me to. So all of that, I, I suppose, maybe, maybe hopefully answers that question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah then <clears throat> I think I told Eli, you know, because he's coming out of Bible college, or he was coming out of Bible college when I had a conversation, but the greatest teacher that you guys will have is failure. Be afraid of success when things are good and, man, your life and people are talking good about you. Be afraid of that because, I mean, it's consistent through Scripture. From Genesis, you think of Joseph. He had to go to prison. He had to be incredibly humble before he could be lifted up to the proper place and the proper minds uh, set. But every, the prophet Elijah, you know, he has a great victory with all the uh, false prophets of Baal. And then uh, he's running from a woman, you know, in the next scene. And he's hiding in a cave and he's wishing that he was dead. Uh, these are the most valuable moments, is in failure. Mm -hmm. That's where you learn. That's where you learn who you, who you are, right? For sure. So do you want to tell them what like, your hopes and dreams are before coming here? <laughs> <laughs> and how that's changed. Yeah, it's changed, like, dramatically. Um, so, like, when I came here at CGI, I was the youngest. Actually, it was the first normal year at CGI. It was the first class ever. And I was the youngest of 17, and you're supposed to be 18, I think. So... Fresh out of high school, no job experience, anything. But I knew I was called to ministry. I knew from years ago being in the youth group and uh, I just always had that desire and knew it was, you know, call my life. Um, obviously going through CBI and um, there's a lot of excitement and there's a lot of maybe hopes or ideas of what it could be like after, right? And uh, full time ministry or whatever. Uh, I didn't really know what it was going to look like for me exactly. Um, and, you know, he's always encouraged trades and those sort of things. And um, so I knew all that. So I didn't have crazy expectations to be, like, hired on staff or something right away or anything like that. But, you know, going through CBI, those expectations build up, right? Mm -hmm. um, I ended up going to Michigan for six months after CBI for an internship. Uh, and <laughs> I was on the worship team sometimes, uh, but most of my time was bone crushing labor, and splitting firewood in sub-zero temperatures from California, so that was terrible. Nice. Um, <laughs> I ended up from uh, there, the internship kind of ended, it was like, you know, obviously the Lord wasn't keeping me there, uh, there really wasn't any long-term things. It was a great experience, obviously, um, and it was my first real job, you know, uh, ever, because I was just fresh out of homeschool, high school, coming into here, so barely any experience. <laughs> um, and I ended up in uh, Whitefish, Montana for the last two years. Uh, it was my roommate here, his dad was the pastor there, mm -hmm. so it kind of just worked out that way. Um, and totally different experience in Michigan, got like super involved in ministry, was wearing 20 hats. I was the junior high leader, taught every Sunday, was filling in worship, uh, Sundays, Wednesdays, doing all media, website, t-shirts, like everything like that. Plus, working a full-time job, I was managing a coffee shop, which is crazy for a 19-year-old who has no idea what he's doing, and I had to hire people and stuff. Weird. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no clue, but I was just thinking when we were talking earlier about being, uh, uh, being honest in your work and being good and you know not taking advantage of stealing those pens or whatever. Um, and I think the Lord blessed that and moved me right up into management, like, really fast there. Um, 
so I was balancing that and then all the ministry at the church. Um, my first time living on my own. Uh, it was like it was a really good experience for me because, like I said, fresh out of high school, coming here, um, and a lot was put on me, a lot of responsibility. So I learned a ton uh, from that, and I thought, all right, this is where I'm going to be for you know the rest of my life. And they were talking about possibly hiring me. There was a lot of things that were looking, you know, like this is where I'm going to be. This is where I'm going to be established. I'm going to do ministry here. You start a family here, like this is my direction, and I had a crazy series of events. I almost died. I was in the hospital for over a week. Got this rare thing from COVID, just crazy. Um, and during my time in the hospital, my stepdad passed away. My mom was there with me, so just imagine it was hard for her. And they've been married since I was like two years old. Um, so all these kind of dramatic things happened. My great grandma passed away. It's just been a lot, and. Uh, Came back to California for a couple months and just, you know, go through the memorial and those kind of things. I was still, uh, you know, healing. I still have some heart problems from what I went through. But I felt that the Lord was calling me back here and specifically to my family. Just, you know, my siblings who just lost their father, my mom who's now widowed. And I called Gary and I was like, I feel like the Lord is telling me to move back here to with them. Uh, but, you know, I'm super integrated in my church. Like, if I leave, like, there's, you know, they're going to have to find a new junior high leader. They're going to have to find a new worship leader for Wednesdays. They're going to have to find someone to do the website. Uh, you know, I'm leaving a really good job, which is, you know, paying me really well. Living my own. Like, I had a really cool, you know, setup there. And uh, I talked to Gary. He's like, the Lord's going to fill all those positions. You know, God doesn't, you know, need us. He'll, he'll find someone else to do those things. And he said, you have a scriptural mandate to care for your mom and you know actually let me grab that scripture because it's been a huge one for me uh it says
could be a long season, but I think it's good. I think I learned I think I learned more from splitting wood in Michigan and managing that coffee shop in Montana and making mistakes and learning how to be a man and figuring out that kind of stuff. Yeah. Because it there's nothing better for your character in ministry than to have a heathen boss yeah. down your neck. You know, because in the church everybody just honors you like, oh, it's a great thing and it, then in the world they just treat you like garbage and that's how you truly need to see yourself. You know, you don't want to be in a high and lifted up place <coughs> where to decrease and let Jesus increase in our life, you know? Mm -hmm. For sure. One thing I just thought of that I think is one of the important lessons I learned was uh, working in a, you know, secular job, a different job from the church. Uh, I was able to, because I was leading worship a lot, um, filling in for the worship leader, and um, I've never done that before, so I'd pick a set list and do all the things, and uh, and I was like the sound guy, too, it's crazy. So I set all that up, too. And I learned that balancing work life and, and ministry life, what that kind of looks like, because there were people that had families, that had kids, uh, that worked a secular job that would come for the worship practice and making mistakes like for the first year like, I didn't have anything set up so I just you know got off work and wanted to go home take a shower get ready for you know uh, practice and uh, I wouldn't have anything set up so they would be waiting like 30 minutes for me to plug everything in and get stuff ready and then I started realizing like man they're even in a busier state than I am they have kids they have a wife to go home to and uh, I was like I need to wash their feet like I, you know, I understand a little bit more now having, you know, a full-time job in the industry, and so I would just go there straight from work. I need to go home and get everything plugged in, set up, so that they could come. We could go through and then we could leave. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. So when you're in ministry full-time, you're in tunnel vision, and you you kind of get all upset. Why why doesn't everybody else focus on the church like I focus on the church? You know, why isn't there this commitment? <clears throat> but when you can uh, understand their world. Like I said, the rabbis did it so they didn't get too high and lofty in their thinking. They did it so they can stay in touch with the people. You kind of show a little more grace when people show up late for worship practice yeah. and things like that, you know, because their whole world isn't like your world where you're just serving God full time in the ministry, you know, and it, you get really to, to understand the people that you minister to. <laughs> we got to let a lot of those people on the worship team. Yeah, yeah, we have a predominantly Hispanic church and uh from what we understand uh, their culture is really late you know and it's normal for them to stroll in a half hour late you know oh, dude, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta set it two hours before, before. 9 30 like 11. yeah yeah so we have our pastors meeting and they you know we're the only two white guys on the staff and we're there and we're waiting for everybody else to kind of show up and we're learning you know yeah. learning different just sit there quietly and they all just show up later yeah, and that's that's the, the cool thing. You know, our church is really diverse. You know, yeah, lots of diversity. When I went to the Dominican Republic, we called it Dominican time. They're like, okay, we're gonna start at eight, but that's by Dominican time. So yeah. you guys might not start till ten thirty. Yeah, we'll just like go with it. I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> my family, we want to start at ten, but the time I be here at seven. <laughs> <laughs>
This, of course, is a lot harder. It's messy, you know, people hurt you, the sheep bite, you know, and, uh, but you're, you're in it for the long run. I mean, we've been through a lot of life together, him and I, you know, and, and Josh and I, we've been through uh, death and sickness and um, devastation, it just all kinds of things. And this, that's real ministry, is getting into the trenches with the people that you are called to serve and just do life with them. When they hurt your feelings and then they come back, you love them, you show them immense grace, and you just keep doing life with people. Long suffering is the, is the word, you know. But it, for for Eli, I mean, that day when we were in the truck, and I said, "So what's your your what's on your heart and mind now?" And he says, "I want to you know get a career and these these things." Now, as a, our elders, our leadership, we're actually Eli is like on a ten year plan now. You know, his heart's in a really mature place. The Lord can definitely speed that up. But, you know, we're, we're looking to him now as a, a spiritual leader in the church. And we're going to start. He's on that road, however long it may be. It could be next year, next time I'm here. He can be on staff. But it could be that 10 years, and that's okay. We're just committed to doing life with each other, whatever the Lord has. Uh, it's up to him. But just get the long-term vision. That's so important. Don't yeah. Have- Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, it's exactly that. Like, I think there's all these thoughts and expectations of like all the things that we'll be able to do in ministry. Like, you know, maybe your thing is sound, and yeah, you're just like so excited to get to that church and upgrade their soundboard to a digital board, or maybe your thing is worship or whatever it is, and you have all these practical things, and you're like, I want to do this thing or whatever. Start a youth group. We'll do these games or whatever the thing is, and I think. There was a good expectation to have here. It's like, I want to come out of CBI able to love people more, able to be more of a servant. You know, the fruit of the Spirit, not, you know, those practical things are, are useful, but God doesn't, you know, you guys heard of it, God doesn't call the equipped people to call. Mm-hmm. It's more important to have those fruit of the Spirit. Amen. I was, uh, in, so I was living in Detroit, I was right by 8 Mile, um, and I was serving at uh, Calvary Chapel, Oakland County, which is in Troy. Yeah, that was a crazy name there. Uh, also, I was wondering, for, uh, for you coming out of CBI, once it all finished up, how was it going from a place that, like, you're constantly so oversaturated yeah. with God's word, mm-hmm. like, into all of a sudden, like, you're taken out of it. Like, was that a difficult transition? It, like, how did you it was so hard. That? Yeah. It was very hard because here, I mean, not only are we all Christians here in this campus, but we're all like-minded Christians who want to pursue ministry, who love the Bible. A lot of us maybe play worship or have some of those similar things, and it's just constant. I mean, in the dorm room, down the hall, you know, on the way to Frontier Coffee, like, Mm -hmm. everywhere we go, it's like, it's our people, exactly like us. And even in Michigan, and being at that church, even though they were all Christians at the church, obviously, even the Christians I found hard to relate to, because they didn't have that same like-minded mission you know, as we all have here, like, we're all just, like, talk a word all day, talking about what Chuck talked about, or Mark Avila, or whoever, and it's constant, right? We're always challenging each other, and Bible bashing each other, and all those types of things, and you guys are doing in Michigan, uh, it's like, none of that existed at all, and I would call some of the students, and they would be saying the same thing, they're like, I feel so alone, like, it's just me, um, but I think through that, I learned to be dependent on Jesus and build that relationship. Like, it's important to have fellowship with one another, but more importantly, to sit at the feet of Jesus and develop that relationship, you know. So you could be on the mission field, you could be at home with your family or wherever, and Jesus will always be there, right? He's the one we want to establish that relationship with. I just want to say I needed to hear this teaching. No, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I, I feel like the expectation was I failed if I didn't get sent out mm-hmm. into ministry somewhere, you know? Yeah. So, and, and, yeah, along with that, like, we, 
we get a lot of Bible knowledge about like what's in the Bible. We just have you guys come here and like remind us that it's like it's about love and like loving people. It's just it's such a good reminder to have because like you know I love your I love what you said right there in the beginning. And I, I wrote down what I could remember, but just like there's so many so many like Bible colleges that are trying to teach their students to be like arguing Pharisees when we should just be loving people. Yeah. And like like yes, we need to have Bible knowledge, we need to be able to converse with people, but like it's not about arguing. We're not yeah. trying to win arguments, we're trying to win souls, you know. Yeah, so. I think Chuck is the one who said if you argue someone in, it can be argued out. The apologetics is really important, don't get me wrong. You, you want to know how to defend your faith, but it's more for personal, it's not something you can use as a weapon, it's a defense of the faith, you know, you want it there for, so you know where you stand in your faith, it, you know, it's not something to launch on an unbelieving world. They don't care, you know, they don't, they can't be convinced. It, this is the thing that it, on social media that I've seen, and I'm not on social media anymore, but I would watch the arguments down the threads and nobody has ever won to the other side. Have you guys ever seen anybody ever won <laughs> over? Never, right? It's a fruitless place to debate and argue. They're never won. But when you take someone out to a restaurant, hey, let's go get lunch or something, and you're face to face with them, there's a different reality to that, you know, a tangible reality. And that's where fruit comes from. Yeah. I'll tell you, my wife taught me that Christian hospitality is the greatest tool in evangelism. Is inviting your unbelieving co-workers and family members into your home and, and just serving them and loving them, hearing their story, letting them know that you care about them, their hearts will open wide open to you. No, yeah, I, I, I'm appreciative. I'm on the same page as Lucas because, because for me, um, I've been wrestling with the thought of like, man, like, I, I want to go back to work after this and, and volunteer in my church. Yeah. I want to serve. Like, I don't want to understand what go like, the payroll. Yeah. And for me, it's like been a wrestle because it has been like, man, like, like man, if I don't go into a full time ministry, it, it, quote unquote, I get back. Right. You know, but at the same time, it's like, for me, like, I've been like wrestling. It's like, man, like, God, like, I, I, I desire to work. I, I don't like sitting down in these chairs all day. Like, it literally, physically hurts my body. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, honestly, I, I got back problems now, man. Because back in the chairs, it's just like, oh, like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. God, like, I want to go back to work, and this is just been awesome because I think God does really have an awesome way of working with you. Because I grew up with construction with my dad growing up, yeah. and it's so true, just what a shovel can do to you. you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is important time. Yeah. No, yeah. Soak it all up. This is this is something I've always dreamed to have. You guys are very blessed, but don't stay here. You know, take what they teach you here and take it out into the world and use it practically. If you don't know where to serve, clean and true. Every church. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, that's where I learned that I love Jesus is when I was serving the cleaning field. Yeah. My dream, I mean, in the beginning of all this, I wanted to get a good job, be a great tither, and support the pastor, yeah. and just be there for him, you know? That, to me, that's like ideal, you know? Yeah. And, the, and then the Lord kind of dragged me to this place. And I, I love my job. I love what we do. But it, it's not easy. It's not what I... Uh, dreams about doing, you know. Those ambitions aren't bad ambitions. Pastors love guys like that, man, who just be faithful and the men should be next to them. And I do have a question. How do you manage, because it, it becomes hard, you know, and, and, and I understand. How do you manage running a business, having a wife? I don't know if you have kids, but you know, oh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. How do you manage the balance of having your company, having a wife, having your children, and still being the senior pastor, and having a shepherd yeah, yeah sure. it's um. It, you think of uh, the time other people spend scrolling on their screens, or you know, lounging around, or doing just wasteful things. You know, so I try to capture those hours mm -hmm. and use them productively. Mm -hmm. uh, my son, he's five years old. It's his wood business, really. We call it Freedom's. His name's Freedom. It's Freedom's Wood. Uh, he's out there stacking the wood with me. He's He's an outgoing extrovert, so we go and meet the clients, and he's talking to them, you know, what's your name? Are you married? You know, and he's great. But we spend time that way, working shoulder to shoulder, and he loves it, you know. It's awesome. It's a time for us to be together. The girls join us sometimes, and you know, just, just try to capture every hour that we possibly can. Yeah. I mean, even if I go to the gym, 
I'm listening to teachings, you know, Damien Carl or somebody that I like, you know, and I'm always trying to keep it productive, whatever I'm doing. I don't want to waste time. Yeah, you let your kids do ministry with you too. Yeah, no, I, I love yeah. that because I gotta have kids, you know, but I have little brothers. Yeah. And it was hard with me growing up because I grew up in a, in a home that we knew about God, but never, never really like, saw God. And so it was kind of like, it is what you didn't do because there's no magic. And with that, it created like a really bitter heart. Yeah, yeah. Like my I, I just I, 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 I,
pretty awesome. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think my wife just came out of the country. <laughs> yeah. oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, they're doing that more, more and more place too. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I just like the black and yellow. Yeah, yeah. I like yeah. it. Thank you guys. Thank you guys.